Wow, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I guess it sounds like I'm breathing, but I've been chasing bees. <laughs> praise God. Uh, those of you who are going to be with me today, come on in. I'm looking forward to having a very uh, uh, encouraging discussion. Still talking about using your spirit mind to rise above difficulties. Using your spirit mind to rise above difficulties. And so if you tune in with me today, I pray that you'll call your friends and family. This is going to be a very insightful lesson. I have uh, received some news about a very good, the passing of a very good friend of mine. And uh, his name is Apostle uh, Bernard Morris. And um, he had a beautiful family, very strong uh, man of God, very loving, a very consistent friend. I tell you the truth, we're going to really miss him. Transition. Seemingly very suddenly, and so it's it's one of those seasons where we really got to keep each other up in prayer and make sure that we do what we can to um, to walk in love and walk in forgiveness and to just be there for each other as much as we possibly can. And so uh, I pray that you'll be with me today, that you'll go ahead and let all the family know that we're on the air. That this lesson is going to start at 12 noon today. Again, talking to you from the subject of using your spirit mind to rise above difficulties. Your spirit mind, your spirit mind. One of the things that I want to try to do with this lesson <clears throat> is, uh, hey, Sister Gordon, praise the Lord, and Sister Samika Cummins, and Sister Cynthia Steele, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's really, really something. Uh, you all remember Apostle Morris had um, such a unique way in friendship to appeal <clears throat> to us. And uh, we just developed a very strong bond over, the, uh, over our tenure in ministry and just um, stayed in contact with each other. Sister Hines. So, so glad to see you today. Um, <clears throat> hey, sweetie. You know something? It's very important, um, you all, that regardless to uh, what happens in our lives, that we find a way to be, be there for each other, at least in word. Hey, James, praise the Lord. So good to see you, man. Um, it always encourages Bishop's heart, man. Every time I see you on this broadcast, I want you to know that. <laughs> I love you both. <laughs> You mean a lot to me. Um, all of you are very special to me. I tell you the truth. I thank God that um, he's given me the ability to, to love. And, you know, one thing about people and about all of us is that, you know, the way I learned the scriptures, the Bible teaches us about how uh, we got to be in position uh, to love each other because love not only covers a multitude of sin, but true love, in its essence, gives us the ability to look beyond each other's faults and see uh, each other's needs, whether we're brothers and sisters or not. It's very important for us to realize that flesh is frail and humanity is full of faults. And so that's why it's important for us to stay in position to at least keep some type of leverage of love through grace for each other, wherein uh, we can stand in the gap for each other at all times in prayer and and we do it fervently so and we cannot allow the enemy to do anything to to poison us towards each other. Now, the reason why I said that, and this is not my lesson today, I'm just taking a few minutes while I'm greeting some of you, um, is because one of the most important lessons I believe I've taught this year is the lesson of double, the law of double reference. You all may not be aware of how easy it is for the devil in your good, um, through your good wishes and well-meaning, <clears throat> how the devil is able to implant um, ideas and, and 
events and occurrences that make it appear as if you no longer love each other, that you're against each other. The Bible says he's an accuser of the brethren. And so one of the things he does to us all, hey, Sister D, is he creates these situations that give us the right kind of offense and the right kind of, um, of um, I don't know, whatever it is towards each other. And the next thing you know, uh, we're feeling uh, the need to really just kind of selfishly um, deal with it as if we shouldn't talk it through or pray about it and do it like the word says. Christianity gives us the ability, if we practice the word properly, it gives us the ability to always be able to get over whatever happens in our lives. And some things aren't as easy to get over as other things are. But let me tell you something, just as sure as you keep living, you're going to run into a season where in many cases, the very graces that you take for granted, you can actually need uh, for assistance. And so we're all, you know, we, we got to learn how to become assets to each other. That's why the Bible said, um, forgive your, your, your brother, his trespasses. One of the most common things we do is cross each other's boundaries because the one thing we don't do is orientate each other to what our boundaries are. You'll be amazed at how many relationships right now, marriages are struggling right now because you got a husband and wife that lives together, but they never sit down and have the conversation about what really uh, is a trespass to me, where you, where you cross your boundaries with me. And so they keep offending each other. The Bible says offenses must come. Woe to those who bring them. We got to learn how to care enough for each other and for the relationship we're in to be transparent and open so that the devil does not give any of us cause or justifiable reason to be separated from each other, as, at, at least in spirit. Now, why did I say in spirit? Because the Bible says in unity there is strength. Now, listen at this. If in unity there is strength, what is it in disunity or division? The Bible says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And you've heard me say countless times since the pandemic started that one of the reasons why the pandemic happened was because God was displeased with the church being disunified and segregated and um, so dispersed without scriptural care for each other. One of the things the scripture does for Pastor Bush is serve as my mind. The scripture is my, the corridor of my mind. It is the, it is the thought chamber of my reasoning. And the reason why the Bible says cast down reasonings and every high thing that, that war against the knowledge of God in second Corinthians or in chapter 10 verses three through five is because what happens in the carnal mind is your thoughts make you very selfish and they make you very um, uh, self-defensive and self-conceited. And as a result of that, you become self-protective. And all of a sudden, uh, the people that really love you, that really desire to be a grace portion in your life, cannot reach you any longer because you're thinking things that are not consistent with Scripture. So when I made the statement that um, I've learned to let the scriptures be my mindset, that is how I live. And I understand, just like my mind sometimes assumes and presumes and my, my mind sometimes estimates and I create, come up with these things that, um, I come up with these things sometimes that will defend me, that'll defend my heart. You know, the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So what I do, if I'm not careful, and this is what helps me to be good for you, what I'll do is I'll find myself in such a, a defensive mode, such, such a defensive posture that I will not allow my love to, uh, to, to go forth and to be manifested the way that it should. And as a result of that, I isolate myself because my thinking is not consistent with Scripture. Now, there is some isolation that's necessary in order for you to live uh, the life that God has called you to. But in most cases, when you're handling any kind of offense 
you got to get in the scripture and you got to let your mind be regulated by what the word of God says. Trust me, the enemy knows through the law of double reference how to access you through your spirit at any given moment. One of the most important statements I've ever made regarding relationships is, and this was a startling discovery years ago that was revealed to me. God said to me in a devotion, he said, all men are pawns in the hand of the devil who do not know who they are. If you don't know who you are, the less you know about yourself, the easier it is for the devil to use you. And at any moment, like pawns in the hand of the devil, he's able to turn us against each other. Listen, we cannot live apart from each other. God is not trying to build us individually, although that is a part of his aspiration. His main focus is to build his body. We are the bride of Christ. And so the Christ is the head, we are the body. He's trying to teach us how to love without dissimulation. In other words, love without reason to defend yourself from those that should be inclusive in your life. Do not let the devil continue to isolate you. I'm telling you, saints, what the devil wants to do is isolate you so that he can handle you the way he desires, and that is to fragment the body of Christ so that you don't have the strength nor access to the leverage of grace that others can apportion to you. So today, uh, in this lesson, using your spirit mind to rise above difficulties, I want to just divide life into two categories. I want to divide it into common daily experiences, and then I want to divide it into uncommon challenges that you may face uh, during the run of a day. So there's common challenges and there are uncommon challenges. Now, there's some other segregations I could make, but just, just for the sake of time today, all of you know how to seize the moment when it comes down to common challenges. We learn how to deal with life's common challenges, just like brushing our teeth and washing our face and hygiening ourselves or putting on our garments. But the problem we have where strength is necessary is when an uncommon challenge happens to us, watch this, but it's even though it's common to us, it's uncommon for this challenge to occur because we don't have to face it that frequently. It's kind of like, now, let me start from a, from a very extreme place. Like death, we live every day living, not dying, or we live to live, not to die. So when we hear or when we experience someone very close to us that's endear, endearing to us, when we sense that loss and we have to deal with it and reckon with it, all of a sudden we find our hearts needing to make new adjustments and to find new alloys and to try to gain strength from places that we're not accustomed to. Well, what my lesson is designed to do is help you be prepared for the uncommon challenges that you may face in life. Now, like Sunday, we prepared to minister a very, very powerful message on Sunday morning. By the time we hit the switch, everything just died. So that was a challenge that we were sort of prepared for, but not prepared for. Because A, even though we were dealing with the electrical, uh, the electronic side, trying to really figure out what was happening, we did not know how it would affect us psychologically and emotionally. Well, by the time it was time for me to go on the air, I was sort of spent. So it made it a little difficult, even though we tried to praise and tried to worship our way through it a little bit. The challenge and the pressure of just dealing with having to deal, having to do a virtual lesson <laughs> and, a, and a worship service with people in their homes and they don't understand the challenges you're having to face. All of that was context in uh, the run of the lesson on Sunday. So we really just didn't feel comfortable about it at all. But now what I want you to see is this. The spirit always tries. Your spirit man always tries to alert you that something different is about to befall you. Let me work from that place. And I'm going to give you today. I'm going to go ahead 
and give you several points of emphasis so that you can work through this lesson with me. Some of you may need to use this for your home. Some of you may need to use this on your job. Some of you may need to use this in your friendships. Some of you may just need to use it in your family. I don't know. But listen, this is a very divine impartation because it's strategically necessary for us to know that when we are weak, he is strong. And I'm talking now mainly to those of us who are born again. Now watch this. Now, I said to you earlier, your spirit mind has the ability to visit your tomorrow today. And even though I teach this, now listen at me carefully. I'm not saying you still can't be caught off guard. I'm not saying that there aren't things, there are things out there that cannot uh, affect you in a way that it really sets you back for an extended period. I'm not saying that. I am saying that when there is something pivotal about to happen in your life that's life-changing, your spirit is so connected to God that it has the ability to retrieve sensitive, watch this, neurological information that can be passed into your brain and into your the mind of who you are, the spirit of who you are, in a way that it causes you a type of uneasiness and and all of a sudden you feel like something is about to happen or something is wrong, but you can't put your hand on it. So what I'm going to do here, let's do this today to make this a simple lesson. And I'll, I'll go back to Gethsemane later because I really want to redo that and, and really show you why that was very impactful for me. But if you turn with me today to the book of uh, Acts, I want to show you an experience here that Peter had in the book of Acts, in uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 7, verses 9 through 17, and verses 19 through 22. Now, the Bible says there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. Notice it says he was a devout man, one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed to God always. Verse three says about the ninth hour of the day. Now, I want you to listen to this because I'm going to give you this point in just a moment. It says about the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, now two things just happened. Cornelius is wide awake. His mind is conscious. And now God chooses at that moment. Now, let's go back to the law of double reference because you remember, this is the same God who unveiled himself through Peter when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Notice, and Jesus said by confirmation or affirmation, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee. In other, in other words, your intellectual mind, your carnal mind, all that you know and understand did not reveal this unto you, but the Father has saw it necessary to reveal my identity to you through your spirit. Immediately after that, the devil goes to work and he says, well, if God's going to reveal himself through Peter's spirit. I'm going to manifest myself in Peter's spirit. And the very next moment, a few moments later, Peter begins rebuking Jesus. Remember that, the law of double reference. So here, I want you to see that your mind, and I'll go back and make this point, your mind does not have, you don't have to be asleep nor awake for God to communicate with you. Your mind just needs to be open to God. And the reason why I need to really drum beat that point is because some of you, you get so offended with life till it offends you with God. And then when you get offended with God, you close your mind. Listen, revelation nor faith can talk to a shut mind. You got to keep your mind open. Even when you fall asleep, keep your mind open. Believe on God. Trust in God. Even though you may not know how to express him and to intellectualize him, you may not know how to explain him. You may not even understand him. Keep your mind open to him 
and he will manifest himself to you eventually in a way that's comprehensive to you and no one will be able to take that piece of understanding from you. Listen at me now, this is important. So the Bible says in verse three about the ninth hour of the day, pay attention now, Cornelius saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Now in this vision, notice God spoke to him much like he did in Genesis chapter 15 with Abraham, etc. Notice, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? Now he's talking to a vision <laughs> because that's how strong your mind is. And that's why you fight so much in your mind. That's why you got to be careful to purge your thoughts. That's why Philippians chapter four is so important because he tells us to, to be careful how we think because if you don't force your mind to think acceptable thoughts regarding people and praise the Lord, I hope I didn't lose you all. I don't know what that was, but some, I had some kind of glitch. I know the devil, show, he shows up. I don't know about everybody else's broadcast, but I have to fight the devil to get you all a word now. <laughs> That's all right. Let me press this word on in. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now, keep this in mind. And if you follow me closely, I deal with these lessons more intricately in other phases, but just for the sake of time today, he's telling him your faithfulness to believe on me because of, watch this, my word to you. You have obeyed my sayings in giving alms. You have obeyed my sayings in praying to me. You have trusted in me in even though, listen, watch this, even though you had no confirmation or affirming communication from me, that's where serving God is very important. He that come up to God must first believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. Now, why is that this important? Because all of us go through those periods and those seasons and those times where it seems like we're just praying in the air, when we're just giving to nothing, when we're just, just doing without a real reason, when there's no nothing on the other side confirming what we're doing. But listen at what happened. <laughs> this is so good because it says, God said to him in a vision, watch this, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before me. In order for them to come up for a memorial, take the word memory, memorial, in other words, annually, you've done this thing frequently, you've done this thing faithfully, regardless to the fact that you, you had problems, Cornelius, discerning my voice and hearing from me. You just obey my word and you keep praying and you keep giving as if I'm answering you. And I am. I'm going to answer you now. And I want somebody out there to understand. In your faithfulness to God, your day is coming when God is going to unveil himself to you in a way that you're going to say, most assuredly, I have talked with God. I have had a visitation from the Lord. And I'm here to tell you this is so important because now he gives him instructions. He said, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Now, this is important because during this time, the Gentiles had not been included into the family of God by way of the Christian practice. Listen, Judaism did not allow Gentile worship. And so Phariseeism and all the other uh, scribeism and all that other stuff, all of these were resistant to Gentiles practicing the principle of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. I call it the kingdom citizenship. Well, you may have called it Christian. They were first called Christians in Antioch, and that was not the term that um, they were using prior to that. So now you got to understand, they were not practicing the principle of Christianity at this point because they were seen as Gentiles, but this guy Cornelius was faithful to the principle. That's why I tell you, God is not a respecter of person. He is a respecter of principle. And in this, his, his, his obedience to the principle came up as a memory, a memorial before God. God said, boy, this cat is consistent. 
He does it every week. He does it every month. He does it every year. He does it annually. Let me go down and visit him myself. And that's what God is saying to some of you about your family and your situation. You've been faithful and I'm coming to see you. I'm going to unveil myself to you and make myself known to you in a way that you're going to, to know that I am here to carry you to the next phase of your existence. And when the angel spoke to him, he departed and, and had departed. Cornelius called in verse seven, two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited to own him continually. Now, the Bible says the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now watch this now, you gotta get me now. <laughs> about the ninth hour, Cornelius has, has this vision. About the sixth hour, now Peter went up to the housetop to pray and notice what happened in verse 10. Would you all look at this with me? I keep telling you, your spirit man picks up things that your mind does not know how to discern because whenever something major is about to happen in your life, whenever something pivotal is about to happen in your life, what your spirit man is trying to get you to do is calm yourself down, quiet your behavior and your activities and set aside some time so you can get alone and hear the voice of God through meditation. Now, what we see in these spiritual experiences in the scripture is how God just unveiled himself to these people and how he manifested himself. But what I'm trying to show you is that's why he set the principle up. He was showing us that your spirit man gets uneasy. It becomes, watch this, all of a sudden, let me just read it then, verse 10. You all, you all are with me in Acts chapter 10, verse 10. Then he became very hungry. Isn't that strange? Now he went up on the rooftop to pray <laughs> and then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. Boy, I tell you, we would normally say, boy, that's just like the devil. No, this time your spirit man is trying to set the stage for something different that you've never encountered before. Notice, but while, uh, while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now here he is, Peter falls into this trance. I mean, deep, like all of a sudden, this deep sleep, he's in this trance where where it's like, man, all of a sudden, he's in a daze. He's being, he's like, man, what, what was happening here? This, this, I'm like, I'm in a hypnotic state. Isn't that something? All of a sudden, Peter feeling like he's hypnotized. Are y'all listening to me? He's in a daze. He went up on the roost, rooftop to pray. Now he's going to meet God in prayer and to do what he's accustomed to do. All of a sudden, he starts getting hungry and he wants to eat. So he's got them in the house trying to prepare him something to eat. But while he's there, he goes into this trance and he's dazed. He's dazzled. He's, he's like, man, why am I feeling like I'm, I'm being hypnotized? Watch this. And I know y'all see my eyes stretching. <laughs> Watch this. Here's the point. Here again, spirit life gives us clues and signs when things are about to be different when things are about to be difficult or when things are about to become more demanding due to the changes and challenges and circumstances that are about to occur. There's this uneasiness that happens to some of you, this unexplainable nervousness or restlessness that suddenly comes over you that's difficult for you to discern. These situations, I say in the lesson, should be approached with more intense preparation than ordinary situations because they are to be viewed as pivotal and life-changing moments. Now, let's see how this occasion became a very pivotal moment. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about Peter first. Peter was so strict at this time that he did not have no time for Gentiles to say anything to him about Christ, about God. They, in Peter's mind according to the orthodoxy of his teaching, religiously so, they were not worthy to be included in the family of God. So God has to visit Peter in order to make him an instrumentality of something that he's not accustomed to doing. 
God is giving him a special anointing. God is giving him a special grace. God is opening his mind to a new revelation and he has no idea what's about to happen. All he knows is he goes up on the rooftop to pray while he's preparing to pray. He gets hungry and in the midst of his hunger, he falls into this trance and in this trance, while he's there like he's under some hypnotic state, notice what happens in verse 11. And he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. Now, did you see that? He thought he was getting hungry for the food in the house, but his spirit was making him hungry. Watch, watch this. For revelation, he had never heard. This is why it's so important for you to let your mind be open because faith can talk to you. Even though you've never been taught it, even though you've never heard it, even though you've never seen it, even though it's hard for you to conceive it. Listen, that's why the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, he kept talking, that's the principle, he kept talking to his mind until his mind opened and his spirit gave him a revelation into his essence. He showed him who he was. Man, you don't have children, but you're the father of many nations. And I'm going to show you how to just be reproductive as you just do what my word tells you to do. Listen carefully. All of a sudden now, Peter then got hungry, but he thinks it's not hunger for natural food. He done forgot Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Wow, isn't that powerful? Give me just a moment here. <laughs> oh boy, we're getting ready to go somewhere. I won't be before you very long. Just stay there. Come on, get somebody else on the line with us. Tell them they need to hear this next lesson because the next part of this lesson because I'm telling you right now, some of you right now are experiencing challenges in your relationship that's similar, but they're a little bit different because, listen, there's something pivotal. God wants to use now this thing, but the devil meant for evil. God wants to turn it for your good, but he got to prepare your spirit. He got to show you how to be a better you so that when you face this challenge coming to you, you overcome it. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And I'm telling you right now, come on, get ready. I'm going to show you something very important here because you got to get more intense about your preparation when there's this the spirit. And what Peter almost did is improperly discern what the spirit of God was trying to do through him. Watch this. I'll show you. Now, I try to keep this lesson very non-technical <clears throat> and, and very <clears throat> language specific so that all of us can relate and understand. But watch this. Here's what's so, so critical. Verse 11. He saw heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. All right. In it, verse 12, were all kinds of four-footed animals and of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, it would have been all right in Peter's mind for that voice to say to him while he was in this trance, rise, Peter, kill. <laughs> because he's looking at it, and, and it's okay to kill it, but he said, kill it and eat. Eat it. Wait a minute. Now, this can't be God. There it is again. That's why, listen, some of you right now, and I don't know how much further I'm going to get, but this is what your problem is. You never tried the spirit to see whether it's of God or not. The spirit, that in the spirit realm, there is you, there is God, and there is the devil. Let me say it again. In the spirit realm, there is you, there, the, these are the three voices, your voice, God's voice, and the devil's voice. In the spirit realm, there is your voice, God's voice, and the devil's voice. Now, how do we put that in? And let's make that inclusive, inclusive into your nature. <clears throat> in your nature, you have three dimensions of sin that you contend with. Sin is personal because it comes from inside of you. It's social because it's the people that you relate to, your friends, your family, etc., and then it's cosmic because it's the devil trying to war with your spirit to keep you off course. The Bible says he is the God of this world with a small g. He's the prince of the air. And that means that he never wants the wind to blow in your favor. 
So you got to pay attention to where I'm headed here because if you don't try the spirit, you won't know whether it's of God or not. Now, the re if you go back and do a test on what God said about try the spirit to see whether or not they're of God, he's given you, watch this, a period of reckoning. You're supposed to be reconciling voices in your life. Some of you don't know the voice of God because when you get a hunch, uh oh, when you get an idea, when you get a, you fall in a trance, you think you see a vision, you don't know whether it's of God or not because you don't try it. He gave you permissive grace. That's the term I want to use. Please write that down. I have permissive grace to try the spirit that tries my spirit. Whenever something tries you, you have permissive grace grace. You have a, a period of permission uh, where God literally gives you the privilege of trying the spirit. Now, you're going to miss like Pastor Bush did. And how do I know the voice of God? When I received a visitation from God that sent me, came, brought me home from Atlanta, three months shy of graduating, it was a vision. I was in a deep trance. I can tell you the detail. It was very intimate. Listen, it's the one experience that has been true to my existence throughout the entirety of my, my place in the kingdom of God. I know the voice of God because I tried it. I tried it. I'm telling you, many times God will speak to me, visit me, and unveil things to me because of my uncertainty. I would try it. Today, I know the voice of God from the voice of the devil and from my voice. I know how to stay unselfish because I know that I'm supposed to be walking in denial. If anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. When I walk in my purpose, it's hard for the devil to speak to me, even though he does still have access to me. Keep in mind, as long as, even though you are spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. As long as you have a body, the devil has access to you. You got to understand, flesh and blood cannot receive or inherit the kingdom of God. It is your spirit that's willing, but your flesh is weak. Now, let me get back to this point. Oh, my God. See, there's so much to teach. There's so much to say. There's so much to share. So much we have yet to learn. But watch this. So notice what happened. Now, I want you all to watch, pay close attention to the language that's about to be used. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Lord, you're telling me to eat wild beasts, creeping things, four-footed animals, and birds of the air. And notice how Peter answers and pay close attention to the language in verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Oh, my God. Now, he uses the word Lord, which actually means that he's under God's authority, and he understands that everything he's doing is supposed to be for God. Isn't that the way that, that sounds like how we are in church? You say, Lord, you say, I love you. I'm working for the pastor. I serve God under my pastor. But then you do it your way. And you forget you don't have the right to change the way. Now, that's not the issue, but that's what you got to understand about lordship. Lordship, the word Lord means I'm submitted to his way. That's why he said, first seek the kingdom of God and his way of doing and being right. And all these things that cause worry. Listen, you will supersede those things. You will overcome those things. It's very important that we understand that order is God's authority an assignment to cover us. It is God's signature way of covering us through grace and covering our household. Watch this. But that's another lesson. Watch this. Peter said, not so, Lord. How are you going to tell the Lord not so? Peter says, here's my reason. There it is. Casting down every reasoning, every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Who's visiting him? God. Who does he work for? God. Who's telling him what to do? God. And how does Peter recognize him? Lord, and still turns around and tell him, but I'm going to do it my own way in spite of you being the Lord who I'm doing it for. Notice what Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. God have mercy. And notice what the Lord, who he's supposed to be submitted to, said. 
And a voice spoke to him again a second time and said, what God hath cleansed, you must not call common. Oh my God. The Bible says this was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now notice heaven is used there. Do you realize that God is able to transport heaven into our earth realm through visions and dreams? Are y'all listening to me? Boy, if I had the time to talk, talk to you about what happened to Jacob when he was fearing what was how his encounter with his brother Esau. And there he sends everybody ahead. And he ends up having a visitation from the Lord. We sing that song, Climbing Jacob's Ladder. But I'm telling you, this was a vision. <laughs> Heaven can be transported into the earth realm through dreams and visions. If I can get you to open your mind, I know things are going to happen to you. What if I told you the reason why you keep, keep being challenged and tested like you are is because the devil knows that God is about to promote you out of that zone into another reality because you haven't paid attention to the fact that that's the way the devil been fighting you all the time. Your common challenge has become an uncommon challenge because this time the devil has included something else in the challenge to make it more difficult than it normally would be. You got to be ready to stand up and that's why meditation is so important. I'm coming. I'm almost there. Give me just a few more minutes. Notice now. Notice this. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself, what this vision uh, which he had seen meant, behold, the men, I love it, who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Lord have mercy. God will confirm it. Let me tell you something. If, the, if somebody tells you that God sent them to you, then you got a right to just have some confirmation. Listen, notice, while God was dealing with Peter, God had already dealt with Cornelius. While God was dealing with Cornelius, he was also speaking to Peter, one at the ninth hour, the other at the sixth. He gave him enough time while Peter was dealing with it. He gave the men enough time to get to where Peter was from Cornelius. And notice, if Peter had paid attention to the vision, he would not have had to wonder in himself what the vision was all about. The problem is sometimes when God is speaking to us, we're so busy being us till he can't get through to us. <laughs> oh, God. Y'all forgive me for fussing now. Y'all, Bishop about to come down the pipe now. I tell you, I didn't get a chance to finish up Sunday, but I'm going to finish up today. Notice here, <clears throat> excuse me, praise the Lord. This is so critical because all of a sudden here, we see that in verse 17, while Peter wondered within himself now what this vision which he had seen meant, Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, notice what happened. The spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Are y'all listening to me? Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, the Gentile, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by the holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Peter didn't know God was preparing him to preach the gospel to some people that he was not accustomed to preaching to. Oh, God have mercy. What if the experience you're having right now is not about you? It's about someone else that God wants to use you to get through to. I'm telling you right now, that's why I gave you these several points. Number one, I said to you, your mind has the psychological or mental potential to visit familiar situations through anticipation before they become physical experiences. I said to you, point two, predetermine that you will look at every difficult scenario and situation, review it and preview it from a Christ position of strength. 
Because Christ is your righteous substitute of victory. He became that you might be. You got to get to the point where you understand the importance of going before yourself in your mind before you get there in your body. Number three, implant only victorious beliefs based upon what God's word says about each difficult situation that you anticipate. Notice what God did with Abraham in chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your exceeding great reward. But Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. What's the point? No. Through vision, God adapted divine revelation to Abraham's senses. And right now, that's what I want to close with today. Because God is trying to visit some of you, but your mind still ain't open enough yet. You got, watch me now, where are we going? Let me slow down. Here we go. Number one, the Bible says, walk in the spirit so that you do not fulfill the lust of your flesh. The Bible says, walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says this faith works by love. So it says walk in love because love is the essence of God. The Bible says everything you do for God, if it does not, if it's not done in love. Now, do you know that love, let me tell you, let's see, come on close to the thing. What if I told you that love is the truest position to the, watch this, to the emotion of righteousness that's that's a part of, akin to order. <laughs> love, all I just said is this. Love makes you live in order. Love. Now, why does love do that? Because love requires you to forgive, to walk in what's called a readiness of mind. Be ready to forgive folk because folk don't know how to stop being who they are. <laughs> oh, God. We don't know. Listen, people don't change overnight. Can a lion, excuse me, can a leopard change his spots? No. Listen, who can say I'm pure and, 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 and free from sin and made my heart pure and clean? No, no, no. No, man, there's not one righteous, says the Lord. Since we're going to need each other as brothers and sisters, you better put yourself in a position so that you can walk in love. Your faith needs to be guided by love. Let, let me tell you, if it's not charity, it's failure. Well, the prophets that they shall fail, tongues they shall cease, knowledge it shall vanish away. But charity never fails. Love covers a multitude of sins. Are you hearing me? If your brother sins against you 490 times a day, forgive him. Right now, some of you need to just say, Lord, get this mess out of my heart. Change the posture of my mind. Help me to stop being so selfish. Let me tell you something that, that this pandemic is doing for us. It is whether, whether people are dying because of COVID-19 or what. One thing we must reckon with. We've never seen a season like this where death happens at such an astronomical rate. It has, listen, it has no consideration of age, of color, of race, of, of class, of culture. Are y'all listening to me? Of gender. It is so important that we gain reference with God. Listen, the very person that you are holding grudges against right now, you might never see them again. It is so important that when the spirit of God is trying to get you to speak to your brother, to speak to your sister, to reach out to your loved one, to get over it, if they ain't big enough to let it go, you be bigger. Come on here. Because you got the power of Christ living on the inside of you. And it's so important for us in this day, in this season, regardless to whether we're going to hold hands and hug each other and kiss anymore or not. We still got to walk in love. We still got to walk in forgiveness. We still got to have access to each other where we can be prayer, praying for each other and the enemy cannot interfere with our prayers. Listen, you are special to Bishop Bush. And I want you to know today, God's going to speak to some of you through visions and through dreams. And don't be afraid. Some of you are going to fall into trances and some of you are going to going to feel like you're like <laughs> being hypnotized. and so, Come on. So you're going to be in situations where you're going to have visions and some of you going to have dreams and some of you, I'm telling you, and you're going to wake up and say, boy, surely the Lord has spoken to me. Now, it's so important. God have mercy.
Let me just pray. Let me just pray us out of here today because it's so important that we use this lesson as an opportunity to draw closer to him. Father, in Jesus' name, I decree that today you make your power available to us in readiness so that we understand that the reason you died and rose again was not for Easter, but for to transfer your power. You became that we might be. You gave us the ability through resurrection power to rise above every trial, every test. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You talked to us about it. You demonstrated it to us. And then you said it's expedient for you that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. You said when he comes, he's going to live in us and you're going to be with us. And you said the world won't see him because and they wouldn't know him because you would be in us. So you told us walk by faith and not by sight. Father, I believe your word. I trust your word. We believe today, Father, that you give us, give us power right now over all the power of the enemy and no thing by any means is going to hurt us. I decree right now that that family that's been struggling, Father, to just pertain to you. Father, I decree right now you give them victory, you give them power, that you give them the ability to conceive your strength in their mind. And when they are weak, you be strong in them. You said your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Father, we're counting it all joy right now. Every test, every trial is making us better. What's happening to us is working for us because all things are working together for our good. And Lord, we are coming out better than we went in. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. I love you all. I will be praying for you all. I'm decreeing right now that the very thing you need, somebody needs some some, some some finances. Somebody need just some leverage of love. You need somebody to just say, I'm sorry, that it's okay. Somebody just needs encouragement. Somebody just need to feel like the family appreciates what they do. Somebody just need to feel like, you know, it's okay. Like, like I'm going to get through this. Some of you need to know that, listen, though your body is having to be buffeted and tested with all kinds of things, listen, you're an overcomer. The blood of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus against you, Satan. You have no power over the people of God and no weapon formed against them will prosper. Everything you do to these people is going to work for their good. I decree some of you are going to bring up a testimony. You're, going to, you're, going to, you're getting ready to experience God in a new way. Thank you. I'm about to run over myself. I'm so excited. But I love you. And I just wanted to encourage your hearts for a moment today. In Jesus' name, Go in peace, watch this, but grow in grace through knowledge. Be 